what is there for the next seven generations to come and those little ones yet to come. That's my concern for all of the people all over the world. Not only my Anishinaabad people, it's for everybody. We, we could very well see modern civilization come be brought to its knees in our lifetimes. Will people talk about how really frightening this is? As long as nobody talks about it, then it's something that's head under the rug and you can go on day by day as nothing's going on. That's what I'm thinking about the most. What are we going to live in if we do nothing? Well, she's awful bad. I met a spirit in the forest Thought it might help us so I went again twenty years later He didn't show though I know he was there I was not alone I could admit I was a little bit scared These are uncharted waters pulling me down Uncharted waters I'm in my fifth year now of uh, giving these talks, talking publicly about climate change, and I've got to tell you, it's been quite a journey for me. The most common reaction to my talks, there were two actually, but the first one was always like, what can we do? And when I first started giving these talks, I wasn't really well prepared to answer that, um, but that evolved over time. The second reaction was, uh, we don't believe you, and that one really caught me off guard. <laughs> So how did you deal with that? I researched it. They came up with the six Americans. Why was there such a disconnect between the scientific community and society? Because it started in the States, it came to Canada in 2011. So I could just as easily call this the six Canadians because we poll pretty similarly here as, as to our American cousins to the South. So let me introduce you to the six Americans. Here's the first one. This is the alarm. Polls in about 17%. And that's people like me. I understand what it is and I'm concerned and I'm trying to do something about it. I'm very concerned about climate change. And not only because um, things are changing, but they're changing in a very dangerous way. Oh man, like, I feel like we shouldn't even bother having kids and we should like adopt and raise or whatever, whatever, just because you know, who knows, it might be like, you know, zombie land. 20, 2042. Yeah, I'm concerned about climate change for many reasons. Uh, principally for personal reasons, for my and my family's future. But all life on this planet is in jeopardy because of climate change. When I go down, down to the water, by the water, I feel whole. The water, I feel whole. My biggest fear around climate change would be uh, based on water and clean water and drinking water. In Canada, the most expensive, uh, pervasive negative impact associated with climate change, extreme weather events, is our problems associated with too much water in the wrong place. It's flooding, and specifically flooding basements. Then there's the next two categories, the concerned and the cautious. They typically make up about 50% of the population. These people accept the climate scientists, science, they, they understand it, but basically they're not doing anything about it at this point. Yeah, do I believe in the science? Absolutely. So when I think about climate change, it's, um, I feel, I feel lost and overwhelmed might be part of it and certainly terrified would be another part. I find myself, when I think about how I feel about climate change, I find myself t turning off. Then there's the next category, the disengage. It's pretty small, but these are people don't know, don't care. People are too caught up in their own lives to even worry about climate change. And I guess it's just easier to not care about it. And there's the final two down at the other end of the spectrum, the doubtful and dismissive. They come in about 28 to 30 percent of the population. They don't accept the climate science as true. They're not really doing anything about it. 
the dismissive, they're the ones actively working against the scientists and the message that they're trying to bring. So it's those 50% that we're really trying to talk to and trying to reach in this message that yes, our climate's changing, yes, we were responsible, it's not going to be pretty if we don't do something about it, and so those are the people we're trying to reach. Well, we've all heard of the metaphor of the frog and a pot of water on a stove, that the water heats up slowly enough. There's something about that poor frog's physiology that predetermines the idea that it will be stuck in that water and boil to death, <laughs> poor little guy. Um, but that metaphor to me is really interesting, not just because it sort of captures the state of play. We are in danger, the pot is getting hot. But analogous to that frog's physiology, there's something about our systems, our financial systems, our legal systems, our, our cognitive systems, like that frog's DNA is locking us into place. But unlike that frog, of course, we actually have the capacity to choose what rules we live by. And if we can find out what those rules are lurking beneath the surface of our everyday activity, we can change those rules in order to ensure that we hop out of the pot. Here's five measures of climate change. It's long-term changes in the atmosphere and the oceans because they're connected. Oceans and the atmosphere are, are a very interacting system. And it's the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and temperature. These are tightly linked. When there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, temperatures are higher. It's also variability in the weather. The weather goes up and down, up and down, that high variability can be associated with other periods of time where the weather doesn't vary much at all. And we have really come from a period of very stable weather for a long time, and we're now entering a period of much more variable weather. The next one is extreme weather events. These are these 100-year events, or that's how many people talk of them. I think increasingly they're becoming 10-year events. But these are the big takeout punches. These are the ones that, that cause all this devastation that we're increasingly hearing about around the world. And finally, climate is natural climate change versus anthropogenic or human cause, caused by people, caused by people's actions. So that's climate change. Climate change is here right now. It's, it's happened quicker than scientists were predicting 20 years ago. And these are some examples. The flooding in Toronto in 2013. Toronto, that's the number one disaster that they've had um, from that flood. And, and Calgary, I believe, hit a record for the entire country of Canada. From, these, from this degree of flooding. Forest fires, the forest fire in Fort Mac a couple years ago, it was incredible. I remember hearing the fire chief interview, and he, he's right near retirement, and he said, we'd never seen anything like this. It just behaved differently. It created its own microclimate. They call it the beast. And it's because these areas are drying out. They're staying drier longer periods of time. The higher temperatures draw more moisture from the trees and from the soil. We're getting forest fires. Droughts. Um, the drought that happened in the southern prairies, this would be southern Alberta and Saskatchewan from 1999 to 2004, was the longest continuous drought in Canada since record keeping began in 1880. And this drought extended throughout the Midwest. And there was a study that came out of California saying that it was the worst drought in the last 1200 years. That's climate change. And then we'll finish with the cold winters. I mean, no one really heard about the polar vortex till a couple years ago. And those cold winters of 2014, 2015, those were extremely cold for our climate at this period of time. And it's related to the melting of the ice in the Arctic. So think of the Arctic as nothing but ice. It's white and it reflects the sun and it reflects the heat. That ice melts, it turns to a dark blue surface. It absorbs the sun, it absorbs the heat and that's changing the atmospheric patterns. Well, how will it affect us? Well, again, this is, a, this is moving faster than anyone was predicting. It's, it's here right now. Crop failure, this one that we had here in 2012, we had three weeks where really warm temperatures. It was mid to high teens. It even went into the low 20s for a period of time. The trees thought it was great. They came out, they flowered, pollinated, boom! Cold came back. They lost, I think, over 90% of the crop that year. And the same thing happened three years later, just it wasn't as severe. Heat stress, the one I like is the maple syrup business. I talked to a fellow, an old fellow down in Bogner. He's of three generations of his family have been making maple syrup. And he said, John, he said, when I was growing up, we could always count on the third week of March for boil. We'd put our tools down because March 22 to March 28 
we would be boiling sap. He said, now we can't predict when it's going to happen. He said, one year it even happened as early as January. And don't we remember the sap was flowing in February this year, only to be shut down. And this is causing heat stress. And one of the measures of heat stress is that the sugar content in the sap is 50% of what it was 30 years ago. So these maple farmers, these maple syrup farmers, have to produce, draw twice as much sap to get the same amount of syrup. Invasive species, well, um, I've picked the uh, black deer tick and the dogs because the Ontario Veterinary Association, they've labeled March as official tick month now. They have a public information campaign called TikTok. Um, but our pets, you know, they tend to get out in the woods and tell in the fields and they're getting these deer ticks which carry Lyme disease. But our kids are also getting it now and people are getting it. Last year there were three cases in Sudbury of school kids. In the last two years I've treated two dogs that I have seen in this area with no travel history that had clinical signs of Lyme disease, that tested positive for Lyme disease and also responded to the treatment for Lyme disease. So that would be the three things that we need to conclusively say that they had a Lyme infection. Grey Bruce Health Unit published a 68-page document on climate change, the impacts on people's health right now. They divide it six different categories of health impacts now, and of course this is only going to get worse as we go forward. So those are some of the ways that climate change is going to affect us. And we see that on average from the early 60s till now, temperatures have increased by 22%. The five warmest years, we've got to go all the way back to 1921 to find one of them, but then all the rest have happened since 1998, with 1998 being the warmest year. We're now at the highest normal that we've been in 137 years. So yeah, our climate is changing in terms of temperature. And the story for precipitation is pretty much the same. We've been increasing in our precipitation through that same period of time. In this case, the calculation's a 20% increase. Uh, the five wettest years are all since 1976, with 2013 be quite outstandingly wet here as the record in 137 years. And again, our, our climate normals are the highest that they've been since the 1880s. So these are all signs that our climate is changing. And recent work that, is, that has been published is looking forward that we're going to increase the temperature and the precipitation for decades to come throughout the rest of this century and probably beyond. And if we stay on this track we're on now, this emissions track that we're on now, just as an example of how that's going to increase, right now we get um, on average three days above 30 degrees um, a year. By the time we get to the mid part of this century, that's going to multiply by a factor of 10. We're going to go from 3 to 30. That's the kind of impact that's coming as we stay on this trajectory. I think that the students need to know that it is upon us and it's not something that we're looking at into the future. For instance, I'll stand in front of the class and I start snapping my fingers. And as I'm talking, they don't know why I'm doing it, but I just keep saying, I'm talking about our reliance on fossil fuels, I start talking about all the products we use it in every single day, and then I say every time I snap my fingers, we are using 1,000 barrels of oil. While we sleep, while we talk here before the class, everything you are doing, we're using 1,000 barrels of oil. And I think that things like this send quite a message and it really keeps the perspective going. And so there's something that I've really, really felt important in my talks of climate change was to try and get, give people a sense that we're on a much bigger time scale than most of us can ever identify with. So we start here, I call this the, the geological scale. And what I've done, I've gone back 140,000 years in time and what I'm showing you is the global carbon dioxide concentration. And you can see as we go from right to left, it tracks slowly up and then declines again. And that's one complete glacial cycle. They take on average about 103,000 years. And we have these data now going back over 800,000 years. So we can look at eight of these cycles over the last 800,000 years as, a, as an example of um, natural climate change. See on the left, we stayed high 17,000 years in the, in the previous epoch. The carbon dioxide was very constant at around 272 parts per million, which meant the global temperatures were constant, which meant sea levels were constant, which meant 
glacier ice sheets were constant. And then it starts tracking down. The reason these are asymmetrical is because ice melts a lot faster than it forms. So as we go from left to right, we would go right into the Wisconsin glaciation. So 15,000 years ago, scientists tell me there were three kilometers of ice here where we're sitting today as part of the Laurentide ice sheet um, at the depths of the last um, glaciation. But about 11,700 years ago, we came out of that and we entered what's called the Holocene, which is the far right of this graph. And for about 12,000 years, again, our carbon dioxide concentrations have been pretty constant, which means our temperatures have been pretty constant. So that's the glaciation scale, and I've taken this up to 1750, the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's, that's natural climate change. And in these 800,000 years, we've never gone above 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide. That's an important metric to remember. Never below 180, never above 300. Over and over again, over hundreds of thousands of years. The left axis is the same, the bottom has now changed. Common Era, um, that's uh, AD if you like. Zero is the birth of Christ. Before Common Era would be BC. And I'm going back here, well, I'm covering about 8,000 years here. Back in um, 5,600 years before Common Era, 5,600 years before Christ, if you like, the first civilization of Sumer in, the, in what is southern-day Iraq, between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, most scholars say that is the first highly organized civilization with a writing system and so on. Come over to um, 2,600 years uh, before Christ, they were starting to build the first pyramids in the marvelous civilizations of of Egypt. Zero was the year Christ was born and there was the start of the Industrial Revolution when James Watt in the 1750s um, developed his two-stage steam engine that really got that Industrial Revolution underway. Temperatures have been stable, sea levels have been stable, ice sheets have been stable through the entire development of our civilization over these several thousand years. So I call that the society scale. And that's where we are now. 350. That's the level of carbon in the atmosphere that scientists say we have to stay below that to limit global warming to more than two degrees above the pre-industrial temperatures. Now we're over 400 and we're climbing. Okay, the final scale I'm going to call the family scale, and it's about 200 years. And you'll notice I've now changed the axis on the left. We're no longer peaking out at 400, we're going up to 1,000. And the solid line I'm showing you is from data from 1750 up to 2015, the year after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published their last report, which is where these projections come from. The dashed lines to the right represent four different scenarios going forward to the end of this century. And I've colored them green, yellow, orange, and red. Now green's good. Green means our, our emissions peak and then decline before the end of the century. And that's okay. We, we do that, we'll stay under two degrees. The yellow is a scenario where our, our emissions keep peaking, but we get them under control before the end of the century and maybe we start to bring them down. And that might be okay. The orange and the red, those aren't okay. Those are what we keep increasing our emissions. It's just at what rate do we keep emitting them at? And the bad news here is ever since the IPCC first came out with these climate reports almost 30 years ago now, this is the trajectory we've been on. It's called business as usual. So I'm going to put this now on my family. I'm going to talk about five generations of my family and climate change. This is my grandfather, Albert Gustaf, and his lovely wife, Lula Johnson. Albert was born in 1884. He was born in Sweden and um, emigrated to Canada and homesteaded in the southern part of Alberta. Now, they got dusted out there in one of the droughts that was occurring in the early part of the uh, 1900s. And they lost the farm and they, they moved into the woods of BC and that's where they stayed and raised, raised their family. So he knew about climate change, but back when my grandfather lived, it was all below 350. It was all natural. We was, that was still natural climate change. My dad was born in many berries, Alberta, southern Alberta. Married my lovely mom, Dorothy Louise from 
Elmer, Ontario, and he didn't really know too much about climate change till the very end of his life, because I was telling him that he wasn't that concerned. But by the time he died, we're now above 350 parts per million. And then there's me, uh, John Truman, born in 1950, married the beautiful Margaret Stewart, born in 1952. Now, if I live the life of an average Canadian male, I've got another 11 years. I'll see the year 2029. So I got about 10 years left. Then there's my daughter. This is our firstborn, Jessica Louise, born in St. John's, Newfoundland in 1981. Now, if she lives the projected life of a Canadian female, she'll see the year about 2068, 2068. She actually studies climate change. Her research has been centered in the South Pacific and in, in South East Africa. She and her husband are so concerned about climate change, they weren't even gonna have kids. But then nature took over, and they did. Well, here's the family. Jessica, Phil, John William, and now Hunter. Well, John William, he was born in 2014. And if John William lives the average projected age of a Canadian, he'll see pretty much the end of the century. And so the message here from the family scale is it's really up to my generation and my daughter's generation to do something. Whatever we do or don't do is going to be what my grandson inherits. I think this really summarized what we haven't been doing about it, at least at the national and international levels. Um, the re first report came out in 1990, that's almost 30 years ago. Um, the last report, the fifth one, came out um, in 2014, four years ago. We agreed to sign a pledge to hold another meeting to consider changing course at a date yet to be determined. And as far as I'm reading out there, nothing's changed. Well, at this point I probably got you depressed. Um, or angry or both. It can be pretty discouraging seeing it, how hopeless it looks and how how um, quickly the damage is, is accelerating but creator made little things like tiny little flowers and, and little bees you know that are fragile tiny little beautiful things without the bees we couldn't live long I think the lesson is to look at the small things and let the hope come from the small things. Like a hummingbird hovers, hardly touching, bring the crowd to a hush. Behold the masterpiece. The good news is we still have time left. Scientists have calculated a carbon budget, so they've estimated how much carbon we can put into the atmosphere and still stay below two degrees centigrade. And the good news is, we, there's still a budget left. We can still put carbon up there without crossing that two degree warming threshold. The th window is closing fast, but there's still time to actually do that. Well, I think it's definitely important to do something because he was saying how there's a window or a door that's closing fast. The problem is overwhelming. Like, I have a one-year-old son. He's sitting beside me today. Uh, it is absolutely demoralizing to think about this problem as a problem. And we need to begin to think about it as an opportunity to rebuild our economy in a way that is more fair, that is more modern, and that is more sustainable. And as I got down, going down the road reading about solutions, it wasn't very long before I bumped into the word resilience. We have to be more resilient. We have to build more resilient communities. And I got really excited about this. And this little stick figure, I think, really helps to demonstrate it. The guy at the top, he's got a good quality of life. He's a few bumps in his roads. Then he gets a shock. Down he goes. But he's resilient. Out he comes. The fellow at the bottom, ah, his quality of life's not so good. He's not as resilient. When he gets his shock, he doesn't come up again. So that's the concept of resilience. So we have to build resilience. And we're building resilience so we can be more sustainable. And to get, the, to get there, we have to transform. We have to undergo a transformation of society. We have to go from a society of more to a society of just enough. That's the transformation that we'll be heading towards. So what is sustainability? From my perspective, sustainability is really about using our resources in a way that meets our needs in the present, but doesn't compromise the needs of future generations. 
And a really important part of it from my perspective is it's not just about taking care of our environmental resources, but it's really about taking care of our communities and our social resources as well. And so in the context of resilience, the word transformation means radical change. So we're talking about societal scale changes and um, we can think about changes that are familiar to us that would be considered transformational. If we think about hunter-gatherer societies, when that society shifted to be agriculturally based, that would be a transformation on the scale that we're talking about. And to do that, we have to vision a new future. I'm, I'm quoting two people here. One is this incredible Talia Sharat. She's a neuroscientist in England. And I took this quote from her. We need to imagine alternative realities, better ones. We need to believe we can achieve them. Well, the first thing we need to do is change the way in which we approach the problem from a cognitive perspective. Almost all of us are in what I would call passive denial about climate. Even if we agree it's true, and we know intellectually that the NASA is probably correct on this issue, uh, we act as if it weren't the existential threat that it is. We, we could very well see modern civilization come be brought to its knees in our lifetimes. Yet we're ignoring that. And so the, the way we, we change the way we think about the problem is, again, we start from the solution and work backwards. Well, a friend of mine and I built what we call uh, Planet Traveler is the lowest carbon hotel in North America is our claim. And when we built that building, I didn't really know what worked and didn't work in the built environment. And it turns out it's absolutely easy, simple as pie, to make a building low carbon. You take existing technologies and you simply incorporate them all in the same building. You're taking no technology risk, you're taking no real financial risk. You're simply motivated as a building owner to say, my priority is to lower the energy use in this building and voila, 75% reduction can be done at a profit. And the second quote is from Rob Hopkins. Now he's a science from permaculture who founded the transition organization. And this is what he says. One of the key challenges with creating a low carbon, more resilient future is imagining what that might look like. Whatever you've got going on in your community that you want to share, um, that you believe is something that other people, and the, the concept here is we start to identify communities that are doing similar things. We're going to need all hands on deck for this. We got to work top down, we got to work bottom up. We got to work with our le world leaders, but we also have to work from the bottom up. I try to buy local as much as I can. I love to do barter. I belong to the sogging trading community for that purpose, but I, beyond that, try to barter in every opportunity that I can get. And, and I compost, that's my contribution. Well, those are like five really good things. <laughs> if we wait for governments, it's going to be too late. If we try and act alone, it's going to be too little. So we have to work together. We have to build our resilience together. I'm Lloyd Lewis, and I am the founder of an organization called Neighborwoods. We are a volunteer organization here in Owen Sound. Uh, we are dedicated to the education uh, of maintenance and planting of trees in this area. We hope to educate the public about uh, the importance of trees and to, over the next uh, 5, 10 and 15 years, increase our uh, tree canopy here in Owen Sound. We want to be a role model uh, community for a tree, uh, urban forestry. You've got two choices. Do I fight or do I give in? And in my view, giving in is not an option. What do we want? What do we want? And we talk about the planet, we talk about climate action, if we frame it as insurance. And at the most this will cost us, even based on the detractor's positions, is maybe 1% of GDP. Maybe. 1% of GDP to insure a livable planet is a proposition the public can buy. And if this was presented in those kinds of terms, instead of a cost-benefit analysis of the best deal and you know, the, the, the perfect solution for the oil and gas sector to make a transition, forget all that stuff. We simply pay to insure the planet like we pay to insure our homes. And 1% of GDP is a price I think we'd be willing to pay. And I would like everyone to think, whether they be new to the planet, or toward their end of life journey on the planet to think that we can each make a difference every day here on Mother Earth. Do I walk? Do I drive? What do I eat? What do I buy or not buy? Where do I live? How do I live? How do I use water? How do I treat my neighbor? There are so many ways that we can be lighter on the land lighter on ourselves, 
and lighter within our families. That hopefulness brings eternal in me for the power of one that all tie together in that beautiful knit of interconnectedness. One person, one village, one region, one province, one nation, one globe. We can do it. I think that the, the most important thing is to realize that one person can make a difference and 10 million or 100 million people can make an even bigger difference and movements don't come necessarily at high speed but when they do happen they can happen very effectively. Intact Insurance uh, 2015 developed the, set up the Intact Centre on Climate Change Adaptation. The mission statement of the Insurance Bureau of Canada. They want to build resilience. They want resilient communities and they're working forward to do that. And they have a foundation at University of Waterloo that people like you and me can apply for. We can get money. We can work with big business and we can work to build resilience and to adapt to these changes that are coming down the pipe. How does transformational change take place? We think it's a result of three separate phases. The first phase is preparing for the transformation. So that's building momentum and spreading awareness and really developing the critical mass and, and the desire for something better going forward. So moving from the preparation phase, we need a window of opportunity. And a window of opportunity can happen, um, for example, during a time of crisis. It could be an economic crisis or an environmental crisis, such as a big storm. It could also be a positive change, so uh, an enlightened politician or a politically favorable climate. Regardless, that window of opportunity allows us to actually start the transformational change. So the second phase is really about navigating that turbulent time of large-scale change. And then the most exciting phase, and the, the phase in which my research is embedded, is then once you've reached a more desirable state, how do you build resilience to maintain that new state? And that can be done through many ways, such as building strong social networks and building um, support within your communities. My vision for Naked Basics is to eventually be a completely zero waste store. Welcome to the refillery. You can fill up anything here from dish soap to laundry detergent to unscented lotions. The options are endless. Going zero waste is really important to me. Um, I've recently had boys, I've got twin boys at home. It's been really important for me to eliminate a lot of my plastic just to kind of show my kids this is a real problem um, this day and age. We've kind of, because we are all a little blind to it, we we don't see the outcome, we don't see the landfills on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to show my kids that it's easy to use glass instead of our plastic containers. There's no reason that we can't. So if I can, in my household, reduce my waste, that's just one more person trying to make a difference. Climate change has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. Uh, we're not going backwards on climate change. It is a done deal. It's here to stay, period. And the most we can do is slow down the rate of change while simultaneously working to adapt to uh, the expression of extreme weather in our systems. We go internationally. Again, there's all sorts of examples. The World Bank, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum. These are businessmen and economists and bankers. And they're all programs that are underway now to build resilience. And the 100 Resilience Cities was uh, started by the Rockefeller Foundation in 2013. They want to build 100 cities and then resilient cities and then 1,000 and then 10,000. And now that's exponential growth and that's the kind of exponential growth we're going to need. And the United Nations, not to be left out, they have a pocket guide on resilience. And, and beyond that, they've developed a city resilience profiling program. This was launched in the fall of 2016. And they have de developed a tool. It's called the Cities Resilience Profiling Tool. It's an Excel spreadsheet that you and I can get and work with our councillors and work through that and find out right here in Owen Sound how are we resilient and how are we not resilient? And these are tools and these are coming from the top down. Yes, I am concerned about climate change. Uh, it's certainly a global issue that everyone needs to be concerned about because things certainly are changing. 
people need to certainly be on this topic and start looking at our future. I don't believe that we have a, a stringent climate action plan. There's little pockets of good work happening at the municipal level. We've got some new solar installations and some retrofitting happening, but I don't see a plan for our community. With municipal leaders taking action on climate change, where is that? I haven't heard anybody talk about their commitment to a climate change mitigation plan for the city of Owen Sound. Like, I can't believe that. In many parts of Ontario, the local municipality owns the utility. And because the municipality is an owner of that utility, they are a direct actor in the transformation of this economy. We will electrify everything, from transport to industrial heat to our homes. And the utilities who produce and deliver that power or enable their customers to deliver their own power behind the meter, that's the role of a modern utility. And that's the role a municipality has to show leadership in giving that utility the freedom to operate as a modern utility in the new world. There's hope. There's hope, there's hope. And the bottom up, well, there's a lot of initiatives from the bottom up, but this is the one that really speaks to me. It's the transition town movement coming out of the United Kingdom. Here's their, here's their statement of what they are. It's a grassroots community project that seeks to build resilience in response to energy insecurity, climate destruction, economic instability by creating local groups. This group started out at one town in southern England in 2006. Ten years later, it had exploded to 1,400 initiatives around the globe. Now that's exponential growth, and that's what we want to see. So you have a little one in Owen Sound that started up two years ago. There's one in Meaford that's been around longer than us in Collingwood. The, one, the two that I'm most familiar with are Guelph and Peterborough. They've been underway for a number of years now. Uh, the Guelph one our group is interacting with, some of our people were just down. They had a week-long resilience festival that they held recently. Any question you have about how do we do, it's in the guides. And these are available, for, you can download them. So if you're in a community and you don't have a transition initiative, you can start one. Bottom up. Here's some examples of, uh, of, of what that actually is to show you, you know, how they're working forward. Building energy security, water security, food security. We have to develop lifestyles that use less energy. Every time I look around, there's tons that are going on right here, right now, bottom up. The Grey Bruce Sustainability Network, a fantastic organization that's with sustainability projects throughout Grey and Bruce County. So we're looking for entrepreneurial social enterprise ideas and uh, I'm excited to be in Owen Sound now where there's a, I think there's a critical mass of people that are working on similar issues and if we can collectively get together and forget about organizational details and, and those kinds of struggles because we have an organization and uh, we need to get on with it. Blue Water Trading Community, we have our own currency right here called the Blue Buck. These people set it up about four years ago and it's patterned after the Saugeen Trading Company or the Sawbuck. So we have local currencies right here. Uh, the Eat Local, this food cooperative that started three years ago, four years ago, they'll deliver local food right to your door and if you live out of town, they'll drop it off for you. Together with my wife Christine, I co-own Persephone Market Garden. Persephone Market Garden is a vegetable, mixed vegetable farm. Uh, we produce about 50 different uh, vegetable on about two acres and market those through a box program, a CSA, where people sign up and then they receive a box throughout summer. But we also um, sell to a restaurant and now through Eat Local Grey Bruce. So Eat Local directly connects consumers and, and farmers to neg negotiate prices and markups and, and uh, just own the entire, the entire food chain. There, there's a, a huge need for investment in the local food economy. Food is inherently not as, as profitable or doesn't have as big of a profit margin as some computer uh, companies have, as some mining companies have, or as whatever military weapon companies are excellent for a uh, return to investment. But they don't 
help us to, to rebuild our society. The Reconciliation Garden, um, building partnerships with First Nations communities recognize it absolutely necessary going forward because the, the understanding now of the importance of culture as we go through this transformation. It's not just the ecology, it's not just the sociology, it's not just the economics, it's also culture and values. And we've looking at First Nations cultures that have been around for thousands of years. I'm on the board of the Bagawad Alliance. Um, I am a settler in the South King and Anishinaabe King, which is the traditional territory that we're on right now. We want to make sure that we acknowledge that we're on the land of the uh, Sangue Ojibwe Nation. And we're here to talk about climate change and uh, fisheries and the effects on the waters uh, in the area. It's getting harder for me to still make a dollar. I got into my business not to take more out of the resource and that, and that amount that I make that, that make, allows us to survive is getting very thin that we normal see to it now. And, that, and uh, that's part of the reason why we, we started this method. I may not have the answers and maybe none of us have the answers to that, but I would really like to start copying down and find, getting as much information as we can and that we can all put together and maybe somewhere down the line, someone a lot smarter than all of us will come back and say, hey, this is, <laughs> and enlighten us in that, but we have to start somewhere. If I've, I've asked many times that I've come in with, that, with uh, algae so thick in my nets that I couldn't put my hand around it. My nets go out probably about twice the size of this line, and that, and I, it's about the size of a nickel with all the webbing and everything. And in a 12 hour or 18 hour set and that, I can't put my hand around it, and that, and I'm, I'm pulling it up and I gotta whip it out of the, try to squeeze it out of the thing there and it's like a tar. I've had it on my boots that where it just form fills like tar on the bottom of my boat. It, it's, it's stuff like that and I come in to come in and I talk to people about it, to biologists, to our biologists who's supposed to work for the Chippewas and Awash and I get a nice little pat on the head and say nice, yeah, there's no algae at that depth of that, you can't be having that. <laughs> and that's so, again, we get to this point now where I'm tired of uh, asking people, and now it's time to act. And I've, I've, I've tried to be nice and tried to ask them to do it. And now it's time for me to say, it's, I'm not going to let somebody else, uh, because of budgetary restraints and that, stop doing something that I know is right. Canadian Mental Health Association, many of you will know that they have a, a community garden that's now a food forest that came from funding from Aviva, an insurance company, right here in Owen Sound. The Community Foundation, Gray Bruce, now they do a lot of good work, but the one that really captured my attention was when they funded the Vital Signs Report two years ago. This is based on indices of well-being. This is how we're going forward. We're not, we're going to abandon GDP as our single measurement of how well we're doing, and we're going to go to these indices of well-being. And here's our group. We can see right here in Owen Sound our Vital Signs Report. And blue communities, we have a group of water watchers that are moving to make Owen Sound into a blue community, following the Council of Canadians in the United Nations. To become a blue community, a municipality has to agree to say to the, the notion that water is a human right, which of course, since now it is officially, it's not a hard thing for them to do. But it's important to name it, that water is a public trust, and, the, and, and that they will not provide bottled water uh, on their premises or at their conventions and public events and so on. That's actually the sticky one in a lot of communities. They're, they're okay on the first two. Uh, but we have a number of municipalities, particularly in Ontario, that have adopted uh, the notion of, of becoming, of being a blue community. This is a way that communities can take a step to say we will protect water. Now for energy security, I had to go all the way down to Woodstock. But there's a beautiful example down there of an energy cooperative that's just launched last year. Community owned, community run, building local energy, but they're also building local um, distribution systems, microgrids, so that the energy that they're creating stays there. And this is a beautiful example of building local security. Now, I, I hope when you're looking at this, you're thinking of all the things I haven't mentioned, because I'm running out of time and because I don't even know everything. And so this is where we're saying, you know, work with us. But it's already started. These things are already underway. One of the challenges here, I think, is bringing these many groups together with all their, you know, um, overlapping and similar interests as we go forward. So I, I end 
here with us, this is a slide from that Talisherat, the neuroscientist. We, we uh, can't just be like penguins at the edge of a cliff hoping we can fly when we jump off. We've got to build a parachute, and that parachute is the resilience, transformation, sustainability theme. So to me, sustainability is really about reaching futures that are more environmentally secure, but also about achieving healthier and happier communities. And if I end up with one thing, the climate scientists, the great climate scientists in the world say, if there's one thing we can do about climate change, it's to talk about it. So let's talk about climate change. I'm a mom of two. I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old um, son. And so I'm constantly thinking about their future and, and the future on a 50 to 100-year timeline. And fortunately, I am very hopeful about um, what the future looks like in that time frame. So the first thing that gives me hope for the future is how many people are really dedicating themselves to this complex challenge from many different vantage points. The second thing that really gives me hope for the future is, is something that Naomi Klein calls utopian imaginaries. And so what that means to me is if we want to be motivated and we want to act towards creating change for the future, we have to know that there's something better possible. And to me what that looks like is not only greener environments and healthier ecosystems, but healthier and happier communities. So for example, I picture green built infrastructure that creates more livable, more walkable communities where we spend more time outside and we spend more time together. And that gives me hope and that might be my utopian imaginary. There are small groups of people who are talking, but it's really a fringe issue. And uh, I don't think the bigger conversation about how we're going to mitigate climate change, how we're going to work together to live differently in a more sustainable way, I, I haven't found that conversation in the general community or even in my own family. The whole corporate model is built around that exponential growth. Yes. And it's so ingrained in how people live their lives and what, how they feel they need to, what they need to be successful. If we can change the psychology around success. If we solve this problem, uh, it is transforming our economy in a way that hasn't been seen for at least a generation. Just like the internet transformed our economy to be the underpinning of a modern digital age, so too clean tech will transform our economy. In every sector, automotive, forestry, industrial, movie making, every sector that, that uses or produces energy will do it in a different way. And so clean tech is not a sector, it's a new kind of economy. And therefore every profession is involved in that transition from accountants to lawyers to engineers to bankers. It's the kind of economic transformation that's top to bottom and left to right. So no sector and no profession goes untouched. And that is the, that's the scale of the opportunity that we have as opposed to the scale of the problem that we face. We need more investors to at least put a portion of their uh, portfolio into sustainable investment. Food is one of the most simple things in life everybody eats. The food system is connected to everything. It is connected to the global trade. It is connected to climate change, biodiversity. Agriculture covers the most surface of any activity uh, on this planet. If we would get food right, we would not be in the mess that we are in right now. What am I doing about climate change? Well, I've adopted a, um, a plant-based diet for myself and I encourage others to do so and I have a restaurant that is entirely vegan now or plant-based and uh, it's something each individual can do immediately to have their greatest effect on mitigating climate change. On a personal level, the ways to mitigate climate are pretty obvious and straightforward. You know, ride your bike to work, insulate your home. I've retrofitted this house with all air-to-air -air heat pumps, so I have no natural gas being burned anymore to heat my home. Uh, don't eat red meat. So these are all kind of 
both uh, financial decisions we can make and lifestyle decisions that we can make. But the most important thing is to talk about it. This, this is sort of the elephant in the room that people sort of see out of the corner of their eye and they know it's real, but until we talk about it on a daily basis, we're not going to normalize this conversation to the extent that it, acting on this risk becomes kind of like a third rail, kind of like Medicare in Canada or military spending in the States. It is agreed upon by all parties that this is something we need to get on with. And we get to that state by talking about it every day with our neighbors. When I do look at it straight on, I think the, the overwhelming feeling I have is one of grief. It's, it's overwhelming, makes me want to weep. And when I think in organizing terms, you know, people don't organize from grief much. They organize from anger, they organize from love, they organize towards hope. And so when we think about how people organize around climate change or have those conversations at the community level, I think we have to tend the grief to enable the conversation to happen. I think that's, that's a step of working through an expression of grief to, to then what do you do, then what? We are the people that are destroying the earth. We people that have all these monies and dollars and that, the governments and that, they're letting, uh, allowing this to take place within our territories, our communities, our towns, our villages, our neighbors, everything, the cities, the, across the ocean and everywhere. As the father of a young girl, a young daughter, I am hyper aware that I'm going to have to answer to her. She's going to come to me and be like, what are you doing about this? What have you done? But she's going to be looking at and examining every one of my actions. And that's what I think about every day. It's just a matter of you deciding what it is that really speaks to you that you want to do something about and joining one of those groups. If we just keep talking about it and never do it, then it's never going to get done and we can just give up. But you don't want to because what are we going to live in? No more carbon dioxide in the rain. We need to take control of the situation and grab the reins. Man, it's cool to talk about it. It feels so great. So my best advice to young people today who want to be part of that solution is just be really good at whatever it is that you do. Whether you're a lawyer or a filmmaker or a poet or an engineer, this requires all hands on deck. So being really good at what you do to earn the right to have your hands on the levers of power, on the levers of change, is what you need to do. The river is a healer. The river is a sage, the river knows no end, and the river feels no age. The river is a leader every single day, it's living in the moment and it always finds a way. Water in my body. Water heal my soul When I go down, down to the water By the water I feel whole The river calls me over It's calling out my name In the day and in the night I hear that river all the same It's calling me over Calling out my pain Oh, a river gathers tears Just like a river gathers rain Water heal my body Water heal my soul When I go down, down to the water By the water I feel whole The river is a traveler Always on the go Oh, a river never worries If it's fast or if it's slow River, take me to where I need to go
Oh, and I will just relax and let the river flow.